Uh, you know, Steve Deeks and uh, Dan Kritzkis, my, my mentors at various institutions, have always said I would talk way too fast and uh, during talk. Yeah, I know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to do that today, but I apologize. You can look at the slides later. <laughs> Uh, so uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about Epstein-Barr virus as well as uh, CMV and HIV uh, to a lesser extent uh, and its role in long COVID uh, or potential role in long COVID and other post-viral syndromes. Uh, my disclosures are here. <clears throat> and I, I first want to say that EBV is, is quite an inflammatory condition and can actually lead to persistent symptoms with classic initial infection uh, mononucleosis. So here we have young adults, teens. Uh, and, and they get very sick, you know, I mean, these people are not trivially, you know, it's not just a viral syndrome that gets better. Some people have symptoms that last up to six months. And those can be prof profound fatigue that's really associated uh, with this clinical symptom. And not just that, but, but, you know, I think anecdotally as clinicians, we see an increased risk of HLH or macrophage activation syndromes uh, during mononucleosis. I unfortunately had a young uh, college age uh, uh, patient die a few, few months ago because of complications of EVV mono and, and macrophage activation syndrome that, that followed. And also, EBV is a tricky beast. Um, it can change between the latent and lytic stages, and it can express immune evasion proteins uh, that really kind of modulate how the immune system reacts to EBV infection. Um, you know, and, and for decades now, uh, EBV has really been associated with, with autoimmune disease, uh, whether it's mixed connective tissue disease or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Sjogren's syndrome, lupus, et cetera, MS, of course, which we'll talk about in a second. And, you know, a lot of this is now starting to become a little bit more clear, uh, but, but for, for years now there have been evidence that there may be molecular mimicry between antibody responses to EBV uh, and uh, self-antigen. For example, citrullinated peptides, uh, antibodies in RA can actually re react with citrullinated regions of the EBV nuclear antigen, or EBVNA2, which is important transcription factor of EBV in the lytic phase. Uh, and then there's EB nuclear antigen 1, which is in the latent phase, and mimicry between EBV nuclear antigen 1 and Rho60 and SLE, for example. So th these are all kind of correlations that people have seen, but does this really drive disease and really drive post-viral syndromes? And, and to do this, you actually need extremely large epidemiologic longitudinal studies. It's really the only way to really look at causation uh, in these types of conditions. But I mean, I think we were all fascinated by this study uh, that was briefly alluded to yesterday, but, but in science, you know, looking at the longitudinal analysis uh, of MS in military recruits, 10 million military recruits, 955 diagnosed with MS, so you need this size cohort to really look at this, and they have longitudinal data, and there was a massive increase, fold of risk or hazard of of uh, EBV uh, related to uh, diagnosis or new diagnosis of MS shortly after the EBV serial trans uh, kind of conversion. This was not seen with CMV at all, just EBV. Uh, in fact, not only that, but NFL levels went up high uh, following EBV infection, suggesting there was neuronal injury that may also be related to development of MS. Now, uh, now people are saying, well, why is this happening? Uh, people have been thinking about this for a long time, uh, not me, but many other smarter people. Uh, and in MS, uh, B cells gain access to the CNS. Uh, they can cross the blood-brain barrier. These can become pathogenic plasmablasts, and they can make oliconal plans and IgGs. And this is actually what we look for diagnostically when we do an LP in people with MS. We look for these oligoclonal bands. It's almost pathognomonic for MS. Uh, but there can also be, this is a recent paper from Stanford and Nature just a few months ago showing that there's cross-reactivity with, the, again, the nuclear antigen 1 uh, and glial cell adhesion molecule. But also there's been known mimicry uh, with, for example, myelin basic proteins and things like that as well with EBV. So we know about the cross-reactivity already. So then there's the thought, well, what drives this? Is it, could it be molecular mimicry we just talked about? Could it be B cell transformation? Now, EBV can upregulate up LMP or latency membrane proteins, which can actually allow these B cells to get out of the marrow, into the blood, through the blood-brain barrier, and start causing damage. Or there are other mechanisms. Are CD8 T cells being brought in that are then causing bystander damage as well? Now, whenever you have an amazing study with 10 million people, which I have never I usually, my studies are like two people, usually, uh, the bigger ones, so, uh, <laughs> it, it's true, actually. Uh, you gotta rain on the parade, like, someone's gotta be the sourpuss who's like, oh, no, it's 10 million people. So, uh, this recently came out a few days ago in JCI saying that, well, falling down the biological rabbit hole, EBV, biography, and MS, and they said, well, hey, wait, 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 wait. 
military recruits with prior history of EBV infection, rather than wall on active duty, had less odds. Only 1.6, not 24 to 32, 1.6. And so they said, well, maybe other environmental factors that at play, stress, PTSD, increased risk of infection that we see in military recruits. But this study, I, kept, I was up all night worrying about this study. And I realized why this study is not valid. And it's pretty easy. You can't join the military if you have MS. <laughs> so of course, recruits with prior EBV infection won't develop MS because they would have developed it before they joined the military. That was not, I read through the paper like three times last night at 3 a.m., couldn't find it. So anyways, keep this with a grain of salt. If you're gonna rain on a parade, make sure you can control the weather. So before we talk about EBV and long COVID, we have to think about how we think about <laughs> EBV activity, and, and antibodies are some of the best ways that we do this. Uh, just kind of showing you on the left is what happens after acute infection that you get these early uh, viral capsid antigen IgM responses that also decay very quickly. It's also not a very reliable test, but it's pretty good. Then you have these long-lived viral capsid antigen IgGs that come up and pretty much stay up forever. But what's interesting, you have an early antigen D IgG response, also IgA response in mucosal tissues and nasopharyngeal tissue, that goes up a couple months and peaks a couple months after acute infection and then drops down again to kind of very low levels over chronic infection. So you can actually use this as a marker of reactivation. And then, of course, we've been talking about nuclear antigen mimicry for the for last couple of slides, that this actually peaks late. And because the EBNA1 is actually expressed during latency, these nuclear antigen IgGs come up during latent infection. So it's, you know, months after the initial infection. So, for example, you know, during reactivation, if you see a very high level of nuclear antigen, would this suggest that you might have molecular mimicry or higher chance of developing autoreactive immunity? Or do you see this transient increase in the EAD or early antigen response? So a couple of studies already looked at this. I think uh, you kind of buried in, in, in cell, but really a really kind of provocative study for me was this showing that 67% of people with long COVID versus only 10 of those with full recovery had reaction to EBV as defined by this early D antigen response. Uh, of course, the, the, the Seattle folks also showed that during acute infection, there could be EBV shedding that might predict symptoms two to three months later. They didn't look after three months, so not true long COVID or true past as we would define it. Uh, but it was still intriguing nonetheless. So uh, just to skip over for time, uh, we uh, run the LINK study. Uh, so Steve Deeks and I mentor Michael Peluso, who is really the driver of this amazing cohort. Um, we now have about 550 people that we follow longitudinally uh, at UCSF, just in Northern California, uh, where we, in some stage of longitudinal follow-up, over two and a, almost two and a half years now for our first participants in March. Uh, we also do gut biopsies, we do saliva collections, we do LPs, we do all sorts of stuff that we would do with the SCOPE cohort uh, with, uh, in HIV with our patients. And so what we did is we took th just under 300 of our participants who were infected during, uh, before Omicron, so through Delta, before vaccination with the original strains. So kind of a nice untouched cohort. Uh, and we looked at four months after initial presentation of PCR diagnosis. They all had to have PCR diagnosis to be included. Uh, and we measured all sorts of things, EBV serologies, DNA circulating DNA, not shedding, unfortunately, yet, uh, also HIV status. And the reason that we're also interested in HIV uh, is that we and others have recently published showing that there might be an increased risk of long COVID or PASC uh, in people living with HIV. Uh, and this is provocative, if not very preliminary. So this is not definitive by any means, but it kind of raises an interesting question. And so here's our data. Uh, it's now on MedArchive. Uh, and what we saw is when we looked at long COVID, and what we did is we did regression models that were uh, logistic and uh, uh, basically controlling for all the variables that you see here uh, of interest. We look at people with any long COVID symptom at four months or those with greater than five symptoms across clusters. And what we found is that there was a significant increase in um, or, or odds of developing long COVID in those that had a very high level of this nuclear antigen IgG. So not just reactivation, but potentially a high level uh, of this, which may have gone up in the setting of viral reactivation. But interesting, when we look at greater than five symptoms, look at CMV. All the odds ratios are less than one. It almost looks as if it's protective of developing PASC. I mean, I'm not making a causation here, but it, it's just interesting to see this trend. But when we look at specific symptoms, and not only that, but specific symptoms that have already been linked 
to EBV infection in some way, shape, or form, we saw an increased significant independent association with, uh, again, this uh, early D antigen uh, or uh, the setting of neurocognitive symptoms above with fatigue, uh, nuclear antigens, again, being very high. But we also saw a significant independent decrease in the odds of developing neurocognitive symptoms if you are seeing the IgG positive at baseline before becoming infected. So that was pretty interesting. Not what we expected. Uh, but you know, we didn't see those uh, associations, except for HIV and, and gastrointestinal disease, uh, with cardiopulmonary or gastrointestinal symptoms uh, in these models. And so to follow up on that, actually, uh, Joanna Helmuth, who is a neurologist at UCSF, who we've been working with, published uh, a paper. And in this paper, she had one of the most interesting findings, I think, so far in the neural literature. And that when she looked at people in our, our link cohort uh, with and without long COVID or past symptoms, neurologic symptoms, that you know, the CSF chemistries, glucose, cell counts look normal. They look the same. So if you just did regular you know, studies you would do, you would see no difference. But she found that 70% of long COVID folks had oligoclonal bands. Think back to what I just talked about with, EB, with MS and oligoclonal bands. 0% of those in the control group post COVID, but no neurocognitive symptoms had oligoclonal bands. So we also looked at inflammation. We, were, uh, we actually published this a long time ago before we, <laughs> people really jumped on the long COVID bandwagon here. We, we early identified it late, which is four months here in this, in this graph, that IL-6 was elevated, TNF-alpha was elevated early and then kind of decreased using a Samoa uh, sensitive assay. And when we looked and stratified uh, these, these inflammatory markers based on EBV or CMV positivity or reactiv reactivation, uh, markers, we saw that overall there was an, a kind of an increased trend or significant increase in uh, these inflammatory markers circulating in people uh, with either evidence of prior CMV infection or EBV reactivation. Uh, this was also the same for IP10, MCP1. And so even though CMV was highly protective, and I wouldn't say protective, it was associated with the decreased odds. I know, I know. Uh, that, that, you know, we're, we're not seeing a decrease in inflammation, right? We're still seeing these elevated markers, despite the fact that that was protective. So what the heck is going on? Why is this happening? Well, could the location of reactivation mean anything? You know, EBV, we think B cells. We think about in bone marrow. We think in B cell follicles. We think about where this reactivation takes place. Where does HIV persist? B cell follicles in the lymph nodes as well. Discussion with, with Peter Hunt, obviously, with this, with the CMV, and you know, if this is more a circular uh, or, or um, a circulation and peripheral reactivation, could this make a difference? Also, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, Gianella will talk about this briefly as well later today, is that there have been associations of protection with CMV uh, in younger individuals. This cohort was young. They're predominantly, by the way, not hospitalized as well. Weren't in the ICU, you know, didn't get oxygen. But the median age was just under 50, or just around 50, so it's pretty young. Uh, and there's been prior reports, for example, of influenza vaccine being enhanced response in younger people, not older people, but younger people that are CMV positive compared to CMV negative. So could there be immune priming or kind of imprint and priming because of the CMV that's protective uh, or has a you know enhanced antiviral effect up front? But that said, what it doesn't explain is the finding that there may be people do worse with CMV during acute infection, that there's now some epidemiological evidence that have been published that may be, may be the case. So just to bring up some questions for you uh, in terms of what's happening uh, in the study. So just to summarize, you know, EBV reactivation and HIV co-infection are independently associated uh, with an increased risk of certain types of long COVID. Um, CMV seropositivity, on the other hand, uh, was associated with a decreased risk of long COVID, specifically uh, significantly for neurologic symptoms, which tends to be our sickest uh, participants in the cohort. And you know, obviously, the biological mechanisms mediating these effects remain unknown. Uh, we're looking at those now, obviously, kind of taking a deeper dive. Uh, but really, obviously, we need to do more work. And uh, you know, we talk about autoimmunity or autoreactivity with EBV. Uh, we're working with a biohub uh, to characterize the full uh, human proteome using uh, phage display antibody responses and signatures, like other groups may be doing as well. But stratifying this within our symptom cluster, but also by uh, human herpes virus reactivation and, and other ones. Uh, obviously, we're looking more in the CSF with uh, Joanna to see if we can kind of do a deeper dive with autoreactive antibodies in the CSF as well. Um, inflammation, it's there. We know it. What does it mean? Don't know. 
Uh, and then obviously immunoregulatory mechanisms suppressing autoimmunity by CMV may also be at play. And with that, I just want to say LINK has been a massive team effort over the last two and a half years. Uh, we basically put um, all of our research on hold when this first started and, and with Steve Deeks and Michael Peluso essentially retooled on our entire HIV scope and options cohorts to, to do rapid enrollment and longitudinal follow-up. Uh, we are now getting gut biopsies. We're doing uh, various numbers of PET imaging techniques, including looking at immune cell trafficking in tissues uh, uh, and combining those with, with biopsy specimens, looking at viral persistence, looking at that as well. And we're also working with Dan Kelly's group with the CDC-funded study at UCSF in the FINE cohort, which have tracked people that are not hospitalized during acute infection, all of their family contacts, positive or negative, uh, that then roll in longitudinally into LINK and performing these studies now now in the acute with convalescent follow-up for these studies. And I just want to thank everybody, especially Mike Peluso, for really making this cohort happen. He was really, I mean, just really made this, this possible. I got the bunny. He did all the work. So that's, that's what matters. So. Thank you. Did I talk too Question. fast, Dan? Yeah. Not too fast. Okay. okay. <laughs> Questions for Tim? <laughs> So Tim, really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, really nice work. The more you study EBV, the less you understand about it. <laughs> um, so you know, three comments. First, about all related to the MS association. So interpretation of that data of uh, the military cohort is a difficult one. Yeah. And you know, in the paper, and as you iterated, um, they call as soon as they see NFL levels elevated, they say, well patients most likely had MS. Um, you know, NFL is not the way to make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And uh, you just bang your head on the wall, your NFL levels will go up, and the military folks probably do that quite often. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that MS is, it takes a long time to establish a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So in that JCI paper, you say, well, and if you have MS, you're not gonna make it into the military. I bet you will make it into the military because it's asymptomatic for at least a decade. Yeah. And so when you look at the MRI scan, by the time you have meet the criteria for diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. you had yeah. it for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. So these individuals never had MRI scans ever throughout that course till the diagnosis of MS became clinically obvious. So we don't know. They yeah, may have that's had interesting. Asymptomatic yeah. MS. If you use that lag period, then right, then you wouldn't expect to see that. Right. That, that so happen. that makes yeah. it very difficult yeah. to interpret yeah. that data. Yeah. The other thing is that uh, you know the if EBV is an etiological agent of multiple sclerosis, then the molecular mimicry doesn't explain it either, because um, if you look at the oligoclonal bands, you, nobody knows what they're reacting against. You don't find them reacting against EBV. People talk about myelin basic protein, maybe you get one or two of them reacting. Most of these oligoclonal bands, we don't know what they're reacting against. People have looked for EBV in the brain, lots of people have, you just can't find it there. Yet there are cytotoxic T cells infiltrating the tissue. Well, let me stop you right there, though. What do you think of the, the Nature study from Stanford a few months ago, looking at these? Yeah, these so I, I mean, what, really what do, what well. do you make of that in terms of a potential link with MS? I don't think that that alone can it called, MS is not as simple as a molecular mimicry against a single antigen, yeah. because if that was the case, it would be very easy to <laughs> solve MS, and it's not that simple, right? So yes, there are autoreactive antibodies against a number of antigens, uh, and that may be one other. Um, uh, so I think it's still, uh, the etiology remains unexplained, and the pathophysiology is extremely complex. I don't think it's as simple as that, unfortunately. No, I, I totally agree. And, I, and just to follow up on that, you know, long COVID is going to be the same way, right? That it, this is going to be a multifactorial process. Is this partly driving this in some individuals, but not all individuals? Is it a multi-hit effect where you need to have multiple levels or environmental, uh, you know, other other conditions that make this happen? So I think we all we all recognize, I think, that long COVID is going to be very complex, and there's not probably going to be a unifying kind of signal. 
uh, pathogenesis for every person. And I, and I think that's an important point to make and that when we're looking at this, we're looking at a diverse and heterogeneous disease, right? And that makes it always difficult. So we need better ways of, for example, grouping symptoms or characterizing, which is something we actually don't have, right? When we study long COVID, how do we, how do we group people into these phenotypic clusters? They overlap, people have different symptoms, they wax and wane. Uh, and so this has always been the biggest challenge is, is when you have a heterogeneous disease as to how to study individuals within those, within those kind of groups that you, you define. And I think we need to start making some real attempts at, at, at understanding or defining how we, de how we study these groups. But, yeah. Uh, Tim, great talk, uh, reasonable speed. Um, the, the question is somewhat related to what uh, uh, was just being asked about, uh, you know, EBV is, could the antibody levels reflect immune dysregulation not necessarily driven by EBV per se. So do you have any quantitative measures of, of EBV expression uh, anywhere, uh, you know, in, in uh, blood, in tissues? Yeah. And, and if it reflects immune dysregulation, could it be merely association and not causal? in terms of your COVID, uh, your long COVID data? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think this is the challenge, right? That, that we know that during acute COVID in hospitalized patients, this is the Seattle group, most of them were hospitalized, that you see, you know, you see transient circulating EBV DNA, for example, that decays very rapidly. They do, you know, they have symptoms two to three months later, but what does that mean in the setting, right? Is that real long COVID? I, I don't think so, that we would not define it that way unless it was persisting longer out. And, and so, yeah, so this, could this just be a, you know, the system's revved up, you're getting, all, you know, you're getting antibody production just because of that, not because of the specific trigger. Uh, that is also possible. Uh, and so what we're doing with the fine cohort now is we're going back to very acute infection to look uh, both with shedding and also circulating and, and to see what those antibody levels look like. And then obviously we can kind of carry that forward uh, going forward. So that's the next step is really looking at that, that acute cohort will help with that, won't fully, fully define. And then the second thought with that too, um, is that you know if you look at this EBV early antigen, um, the other disease where it goes up is in craniofacial carcinomas, and this I know it's more of an IgA response in the in the mucosa, but but it's kind of it has been shown in other disease processes to be specific with EBV reactivation, even in the setting of malignancy and things like that. But I agree with you that that certainly there could be uh, a non-specific increase as well. Yeah, but if you have a if you have production, it doesn't necessarily whether it's EBV driven or not, you could still get molecular mimicry and auto reactive process from that too. So I think that's also important to, to realize and, and keep in the conversation. Tim, great talk. Um, just a, um, a question of clarification. Just with your oligoclonal bands in the CSF, were they CSF specific or were they also found in the, the serum? Oh, good question. I would I would have to get back to Joy. I believe they're CSF specific. Um, and and I, I believe that is the case, but I, I would have to go back and check on that. Tim, to try to connect your talk with uh, Tony. So very interested data with HIV and uh, long COVID. So do you have, uh, uh, did you look if that is associated with activated PDC, high level of type one interferon, there is any, since yes. you have a persistent virus with HIV, there is any indication that direction? Yeah, so, so the next steps we're taking right now is we're, we're doing kind of deep plasma proteomics, looking using O-Link style um, assays to look across uh, different uh, uh, inflammatory markers. Um, we also have been implementing a high dimensional CYTOF, uh, a characterization of T cell responses, both specific to nucleocapsid and spike antigen responses. I know there's some data later, but we've been using the kind of uh, uh, CYTOF method to really pull out on, on kind of high resolution, high dimensional flow. Um, and, and so we have been doing those, uh, those studies. We, we've correlated it with our existing Samoa data that, that is obviously less. And, you know, we, again, we see like people are seeing, we see these increases in some, but not all, some decay, some don't over time. Uh, and they do seem to be higher in people that have quote EBV reactivation, or at least these detectable of antibodies and that are CMV zero positive, but it doesn't seem to correlate clinically with what we're seeing, uh, from what I presented. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think those are, those are, those are good questions. And, and certainly as we go more into the mechanism of this, you know, what, what is actually going on. I don't know, but it's, it's interesting, so. Hi, Tim, thank you, that was a great talk. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, in your talk, you talked about long COVID and you brought up at least 
three other viruses. So I guess my question is, it would be you know either as a positive or, or negative association. So I, I think this would be uh, perhaps very nice as a collaboration across groups because you also mentioned a very important point that the power is in the numbers. When you're looking at these associations, especially retrospectively, uh, with a kind of ill-defined definition um, or description uh, of, a, of a syndrome. Um, so I wonder if um, something like VIRSCAN, where you can see like the entire fingerprinting of viral history of a person, mm -hmm might be of interest in a large collaboration across cohorts um, as long as there is a good definition or an agreement on some uh, conventional definition so that yeah, yeah. you can see in with very large numbers i need obviously that needs to be emphasized whether in general the virus history be it you know hiv herpes viruses other viruses other coronaviruses mm -hmm if that um, can perhaps identify a signature that is more associated with a with a syndrome that's, that's just a, a thought oh it's a great yeah great thought we we had i think we reached out to galit alter a while back too about you know you know combining samples for virus scan type type assays to look at that exact question I, I do want to stress that when we, we developed LINK uh, and when we wrote the supplement uh, for the R01 during the very early pandemic, the entire reason for forming our cohort was to collaborate with people that could do things better than we can. Uh, we obviously do some things very strongly, not so much with others. And so we have always kept this a collaborative effort. We, we were not in this for our own like kind of personal glory. We wanted to figure out what was going on the quickest and best way possible. And that still have been our mantra in the LINK cohort. So we are more than happy uh, I think we just sent you many hundreds of participant cells, um, uh, and and you know we have 700 plasma samples with David Wall right now looking at, at circulating proteins. Uh, we've looked at exosome-based uh, persistence uh, um, uh, of of, of nucleocapsid and spike proteins and circulating as a biomarker as well of long COVID, and some of that's been published in Annals of Neurology, not all. Uh, and and so so I think that this is what we need to do to figure out. We need to combine forces. We need larger numbers, just as we're thinking with MS. Uh, I know Recover is trying to do this right through the NIH, um, but you know it's it's large and it's you know it, it's a great it's a great that we have all this infusion and I'm you know we're one of the hub sites and things like that. But but you know it's it's a lot of cooks right uh, at once and it's going to take a long time. And but we need to do these fast and we need to do these quickly. And and so that's I just want to put that plea out there for everybody. Uh, we're happy to collaborate if we have sample if we're not you know conflicting with another collaborator things like that. We don't even require MTA. We just ask that you kindly you know keep us in mind and not not patent anything mm. <laughs> based on this is open for all. That's how we want to have this. Mm. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, so for the, the, in the CSF, do you also save the cell pellet? Do they have cells in the CSF, do you know? They uh, yes, they have been collecting cell pellets. So Joanna has been collecting cell pellets. Okay. Uh, and I know they're looking at, at uh, autoimmune responses within the CSF as well. Um, okay. But they have been collecting, I believe they've been collecting cell pellets, yeah. OK, because yeah. one, one possibility would be to also look um, at the BCR and TCR sequencing. You know, oh yeah, something yeah. to look at if there is skewing. I mean, I'm sure there would be skewing, but at least um, you know that could be another direction to take on that. Yeah, well, absolutely. We Thank were you. we were trying to get that with uh, with the uh, the company in Seattle to try to get that. It's just a cost issue, but if if people are interested, we certainly that's something we've been wanting to do for a while. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for the presentation.